Shalom and welcome to this week's Soul of the Parsha class. In this class we're going to look at how small but significant detail within the Parsha gives us clues to answering a very important question. What is Kabbalah? So, the name of this Parsha is Truma. Truma means donation or contribution. It really means to raise a donation. And the topic of the Parsha is that it details at very at length the instructions of how to build a tabernacle, the tabernacle of the desert. So just to recap where we are in the Torah, the people of Israel, the son of the Israelites, came out of Egypt, they then arrived at Mount Sinai, they received the Torah, the following parsha after that detailed some of the commandments that have to do with building a just society. And now this parasha tells us, uh, Moshe, Moshe, Moses is being told, how to build the tabernacle. So what is the tabernacle? The tabernacle on the surface is a structure. It's like a very big um, rectangular structure that's also covered with cloth. And it looks like on the outside, like a, a structure covered by a tent uh, that's supposed to, so to speak, house the presence of God. So God is omnipresent and God is beyond this world and is unknowable and un. Um, no image of him can be made, and so on. However, there has to be a concrete place, a concrete structure, which becomes a sort of vessel for the making uh, present in this world the light of Hashem, the light of God. So this structure is the tabernacle. In Hebrew it's called Mishkan. Mishkan comes from the root Shachan, which means to reside, it's the same root of the name of the feminine aspect of God, which is Shekhinah. Shekhinah means presence, or uh, the part of Hashem that resides or is present within this world. But in order for this part to be present, there needs to be a, v a vessel, a structure. This is the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Now there are two levels, at the very least, of understanding what this is. So on the external level, as I said, the parsha gives us a very detailed instructions on which materials uh, to use and how exactly to structure them and put them together. And some of it is made of some of it is made of wood, and some of it is made of gold, and, and made of different types of cloth and wool. And all of it is put together. And there are also golden vessels. There's the um, um, the, the table, and there's the menorah, the, the, the lamp, the seven, um, uh, seven, how do you call this, candelabra, seven, um, but it has seven candles to it. And, um, and all this is, and the altar, all this is coming together to form the tabernacle. So on the, on the surface, there's just this very, very detailed architectural and, and, um, uh, you know, description regarding very particular vessels that need to be built. But on a deeper level, of course, all this is really like an echo or like a reflection, an earthly reflection of very, very deep mystical secrets. The whole idea that we're taking an infinite and invisible and, uh, and, and in, you know, an almost an imperceivable God, and we're trying to connect, create a connection, a bridge, between this godliness and reality that's very, very concrete and physical, then this bridge is something that it, it has, you know, ends on both banks of this of this river. So on the, the one bank, on the one end of this bridge, it's, it's, again, it's a physical structure. But the other end means it's, it's, uh, it's up there beyond the clouds, beyond the physical realm which means really that all of it, the way it's structured and the different details of it, and of course later on the details of all the different uh, sacrificial offerings that are made and all the other um, ceremonies and actions conducted in the, in the tabernacle, all of these are symbolic of very deep spiritual godly details. So we're going to uh, start before we go into the, the detail that I want to focus on, which is really uh, just a platform for understanding what is Kabbalah, we'll just look at one more verse, uh, which appears at the very beginning of the of the parsha, which sort of guides us in the right direction as to how to even address all these physical details in a way that is more meaningful spiritually. 
So the verse, very, very, very well known verse, is Vasuli Mikdash Veshachanti Betochan. Let them make me a sanctuary or a temple. Right? The, the tabernacle that was built in the desert is really the first iteration or the first version of what would later be the temple, the two temples that were built uh, in Jerusalem, first destroyed by the Babylonians, second destroyed by the Romans. The Jewish people is still hoping and, and praying and striving for a third and final and eternal temple. So this is the word is already used here, although a temple is not yet uh, in, in any foreseeable future. But this whole, the, 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 what, what is this all about? The tabernacle, the two temples, they're all really temples. So Vasuli Mikdash means that they make me a temple or a sanctuary. That I may dwell within them. Right. So the next, the next um, uh, um, word here, Veshachanti, comes from the same root as Shechina and Mishkan, to reside or to be present. So let them make me a temple, a sanctuary, so that I may reside. But then comes the big surprise, the surprise word. And this is the fact that the next word, it, it, what it should be, what it was, we would assume it would be, would be Veshachanti Betocho, that I may dwell within it. Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell within it. That's the whole point of the sanctuary, that's why it's called Mishkan, which means to reside. But surprisingly, the word used is a different one. It's a very well-known basic question. Uh, why does it say that I may dwell within them? Beto Cham. So the, 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 the meaning is really very simple, but very deep, which is that the external Mishkan, the physical Mishkan, more than a, it is a vessel, we can think of it maybe more of as a channel. And it's a channel that that alludes that is trying to point our eyes in the direction trying to when we look at the tabernacle we're supposed to think well really we're supposed to be the tabernacle the idea is that god would reside within us within our hearts within our souls but, it, but that's a very hard thing to do and we need something a sort of intermediate level and the idea of the intermediate level is the mishkan the mishkan is right that's the word that comes before right we have here the word Mikdash, that's like a, a metaphor or a blueprint that we may look at and learn from, and then we could uh, merit to have godliness reside within us. So that's just to sort of give us, point us in the right direction, that we're looking at a, at a very physical structure, but, the idea, but this structure symbolizes something more spiritual. And, but furthermore, it's supposed to echo and and provide a blueprint for something we're supposed to build within ourselves, build spiritually, and build in a way that's, uh, that that we ourselves become vessels for the presence of divinity of godliness. Uh, so, as I said before, the next the the we're, this is just an introduction. Now we want to get into a very particular detail, which is the fact that a certain three-letter root, right? In Hebrew, every noun and every verb. Uh, stem from a three-letter root. So there is one root that has not yet appeared in the entire Torah. It hasn't been in Genesis at all. It hasn't been in, in, in the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus at all, until this parsha. And this is the root Kabel or Kaval. Right? The second letter can be pronounced either as a, as a B or as a V. Kuf Bet Lamed. And why is this important to us? Because this is the root of the word Kabbalah. So Kabbalah comes is really the made up of the first three letter of the three letters of the root, with a final uh, suffix letter which is the hey, to make it a, a feminine uh, noun. So now where does this root appears? Many often so just the, the why are we looking at the root name? We're looking at the root because the root is really the the source the key to understanding any word. If you want to understand any word in Hebrew, first you have to break it down and get rid of all the uh, particular letters that are not part of the root, and then when you're left with the root um, letters, then that gives you the key to understanding what is this all about. So in order to understand Kabbalah, we want to ask, well, what is this root, Kuf Bet Lamed, what does it mean? So where does it appear? It appears 
in the final stage of, of describing how the tabernacle is built. And the final stage this details the structure of the covering cloth. There are actually several layers of cloth. They're made up of several strips of cloth, all put together. Some of them are stitched together, and then you have two sets of strips of cloth. And then there's an act of combining them, of, of connecting the two sets of cloth. And then, how, how does it work? What is the description? The description is that uh, at, the, at the end of each set, we're supposed to tie 50 loops of wool of, of the color azure, tcheret, very important color. So we're, we're making 50 loops on one end, and then we have to make 50 more loops at the end of the other, the second set of strips of cloth. And then, and, and this, this leads us to this verse, the verse says, Makbilot halulaot isha el achota. The two sets of 50 loops have to parallel or correspond one to the other. Each two loops have to stand exactly one in front of the other. And then we take 50 clasps, S-shaped clasps, and we put each side on one loop. And using these 50 straps, uh, clasps, sorry, the 50 clasps, we connect the two sets of cloth, and, th and then we're able to put it on the tabernacle, it's very big. And then it says, and this makes the Mishkan one. So the, the word we want to focus on is, is the word, the first word of this, of this, the words we have here, which is Makbilot, parallel. So as we can see, the word Makbilot comes from this root, the root Kuf, and then Bet, and then Lamed. So Kuf Bet Lamed means le hakbil, which is to make parallels, to sh show or make things so that two things are parallel to one another. Now this isn't the, the, the first word or the first verb that would come to mind when we're looking at this verb. A Hebrew speaker, when, when looking at this root, kuf bet lamed, uh, then what he would say is that the first word he would think about would be Lekabel, not lehakbil. Lekabel means to receive. And if you ask someone what does Kabbalah mean, he would tell you uh, it means reception or receiving. And why is it called this way? Because Kabbalah is a, is a knowledge that's been handed down from generation to generation. Each Mekubal received his knowledge from previous generations, and of course they all receive it from God as well. And and then they pass it on, pass it onwards. But there has to be this moment of receiving, of being receptive and open to something that's that's above you, either coming from your teacher or coming from Hashem, who's all of our, the teacher of all of us. <clears throat> but it turns out that the appearance of this verb in the Tanakh is actually quite late. It doesn't appear in the five books of Moses at all. It never appears once in the Torah, the verb lekabel. It only appears in later on in the third part of the Tanakh, the Ketuvim, or miscellaneous writings, it actually appears in the upcoming uh, holidays scroll of Estel, right? We're fast approaching Purim, in Purim we read the scroll of Estel, and there it appears for the first time, Le Kabel, meaning to receive. It says the Jewish people finally accepted, or were willing to receive the Torah, long after it was given to them uh, during the Persian exile. But, but the first meaning that we have here is actually makbilot. So we have here at least two meanings of the same root. One ha has to do with showing parallels, and the other has to do with, uh, with receiving. So now what we want to do really is we want to look at not just two, but actually three different meanings of the, of the root, kuf bet lamed. And we're going to structure them according to a, a very basic Kabbalistic structure, which is the structure of the three intellectual sefirot. That's how they're called. Kabbalah talks about ten sefirot, ten channels of divine energy that are present in everything, and more particularly within the structure of our own souls. And they divide into three higher, more intellectual or cognitive faculty sefirot, called chokhmah, bina, and dat, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And then seven more emotive or emotional sefirot or, or soul powers that we're not going to go into today. So we're just going to look at the three higher 
intellectual sefirot, and and we're going to correspond the three meanings of the of the verb kuf bet to these to these three intellectual faculties, and this will give us a very sort of balanced and and whole understanding of just what Kabbalah is. So uh, we're going to start. We're going to actually start with the more, as I said, the more intuitive uh, usage or word associated with the with the root Kuf Bet Lamed, and which means, as I said, receptivity. Kabbalah means receiving or being receptive and being having the ability to receive. And we're going to correspond this to the first of the three intellectual sefirot, which is called Chokhmah wisdom. So why, what does this tell us about Kabbalah, really? So the, what it tells us is something very important. Kabbalah is a form of wisdom, obviously, so we're talking about wisdom. But when we're talking about wisdom as opposed to understanding and knowledge, that's the next two sefirot, wisdom, Chokhmah, has to do with inspired wisdom. Not something that I fully understand. Something that that I grasp as a whole, as a whole sort of undifferentiated um, unit, and I perceive it in one instant. Sometimes it's it's likened to a lightning that strikes for just a moment, but for that during that moment, it lights up the entire landscape. I can see a whole I, suddenly the whole everything clicks together. I can see something very very wide and complete. It all makes sense. It the, the flash disappears one second later, and I find it very hard to describe what I saw, and even to understand what I saw, because understanding, that's the next sefirah, that's bina. But it doesn't mean that I didn't perceive something or grasp something very, very real. So chokhmah has to do with a, something that's revealed to me from above me. It also has to do very much with the property of nullification or selflessness. At the moment of inspiration, at the moment of insight, when I have, when I merit to receive a a droplet, a spark of chokhmah of wisdom, at that moment I am absolutely nullified, and 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 I'm not thinking about myself. It's a selfless moment, and only if I practice selflessness and practice nullification do I merit to have more and more true wisdom, as opposed to, again, intelligence and, or understanding or things that have to do with Bina. Wisdom means touching the root of things. It's very high. It's very, it, it contains within it, like a kernel, so many different things. Kabbalah has to do, in particular, with wisdom, because there is a, 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 a super-rational aspect to it that cannot be uh, just understood in the regular sense. I have to be receptive to, an ins- to to be inspired from above. I have to set aside my criticism, my skepticism, at least for a while, and open up, open myself up to a new kind of language, as opposed to philosophy, as opposed to all kinds of ideas that are studied in the academic world, or even the revealed aspect of the Torah that people study in Yeshivot when they study the Talmud, the Gemara, when they study Halakha, Jewish law, all of this, when they study this, it doesn't necessarily require that I sort of open myself spiritually up to this divine knowledge. I can just try and understand the words, understand the details, put them all together. Of course, there has to be an element of, of this inspired wisdom, even when studying the revealed aspect of the Torah, because I have to constantly remember that this is God's words, this is Hashem speaking to me, it's not just an intellectual um, challenge, or, you know, like a riddle to be solved. So, but in Kabbalah, it's, it, it's not just essential, it's, it's, very, the very base, it's, it's a very basic aspect of what Kabbalah is. There, there is an element to Kabbalah which is like prophetic. It's, you just have to accept it. That, that's what receptivity means, you have to accept that's the way it is. Why does it have this weird ten sefirot? Why do I need to go into the uh, the details of the of the letters and their shapes and 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 all kinds of ideas and metaphors and symbols that Kabbalah uses? They don't make any sense when you if you're not willing to be receptive to them. Receptive means lekabel means that I open my hand 
and I'm willing and I'm and I'm open to someone putting something in my hand. I can take it. If I take it, it's not it's not Kabbalah, it's it's lekicha, it's taking, it's not receiving. Receiving means that I'm 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 <coughs> opening up opening myself up, my soul up, my consciousness to receive something from above. And this again to a certain level, it's in everything that has to do with the Torah, I need this receptivity. But it's far more uh, felt in Kabbalah, in the, the inner dimension, the esoteric level of the Torah, than it is in the more external levels, because they are more rational in the way they are explained, in the way that I have to understand them. There's something about Kabbalah that you, well, let's say, in, in, in the nigle, in the revealed part of the Torah, you have to understand everything. If you don't understand something, that's not good. It means you, you, you don't understand what's going on here. But in Kabbalah, it's almost the opposite. You have to not understand at least uh, at a certain uh, stage, at a certain level. There has to be this level or stage or moment, and it, and it should come earlier rather than later, that I am aware of the fact that I don't understand this, and I need to nullify myself a little bit and just receive it and be told that's how it is and you'll get a feel for it and understanding for it later on so that's the first aspect really of kabbalah it's the first stage in learning kabbalah and it it uh, corresponds to the first or more intuitive not the first in in terms of when it appeared in the bible but the first in terms of uh the intuitiveness for us of the word kabbalah to receive that's the first aspect of of kabbalah now we're arriving at the the second one. Second one is the is the the word we just saw in our parasha. Makbilot halulaot ishaylachota. The loops should correspond or parallel, be parallel to one another. This uh, fits the second of the intellectual sefirot, the sefira of bina or understanding. So, <clears throat> what does this tell us? So, we'll just to begin with. There's a very very basic and important connection why are we here connecting the 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 description of makbilot the loops have to be parallel to bina and the connection is that there is a very uh, important concept in kabbalah actually it starts in the talmud itself which is the 50 gates of understanding Chamishim sha'arei bina in order to understand godliness, in order to understand Hashem, one needs to go through 50 gates of understanding. It is said that Moses himself was able to go through only through 49 of them. And then the 50th gate, the final and, and deepest and, and really maybe an, an infinite gate or a gate to infinity, uh, Moshe did not, Moshe himself, Moses, the bringer, the giver of the Torah, uh, was not able to to merit to go through this gate until he died. When he died, he did through, go through the 50th gate of understanding. And of course, when we're talking about Makabilot the loops, we're talking about 50 pairs of loops that are uh, uh, brought together, attached via 50 clasps. So th this is uh, just a very clear allusion as to why this meaning uh, of the word, uh, of, the, of the root, Kuf Bet Lamed, has to do with understanding. But in order to better understand what has to do with understanding, uh, we have to understand what is bina, really, what is understanding. So again, we have to look at the Hebrew word. So bina has to do with the root bana, which is to build, live not. Bina could also be, the letter could be permuted to say bniya, building. One of the things that that understanding does, that the sphere, the faculty of understanding of Bina does, is take things apart to their different components and then put them together again in a in a in an intellectually satisfying structure. And and the idea is really that there again Kabbalah has this uh, semi-prophetic or revealed, uh, I mean, in, uh, divinely inspired aspect to it, which that's what we. That's why we talked about um, receptivity. We have to open up to this. However, once we're open up to it, and we're, we're learning a kabbalistic idea, or a kabbalistic, a kabbalistic uh, description of something, then we have to try and put it all together into a structure that makes sense. 
Uh, it's all built on the fact that there's something about this that isn't regular, it isn't rational in the regular sense of the word, but it definitely has to be put into a structure that's, that's understandable. And how do, and, and when we're talking about giving or showing structures to things, then uh, really what we're talking about, if we're, ta- if we're saying that reality is made up of so many different things, but there are, there's, a, there's a, a hidden structure to things, Really what we're saying is that the same structure appears in several different different aspects of the world. It appears within us and outside of us and on earth and in heaven and in different systems in the world, but they all have something in common. They all have a common structure that reappears in different ways throughout them. And if there is an underlying structure to things, it means that different things are really connected and they really correspond to one another. Element A in one system um, corresponds to element 1 in the other system, and element B corresponds to the element 2 in the other system. And the, if we have an underlying structure, then we have things that are disconnected, but are really they correspond, they're parallel to one another. So the idea goes that Kabbalah is in many ways the art of correspondence, the art of showing how things are parallel to one another. Kabbalah, to a great extent, is all about revealing the underlying structure of things so that we can see that everything in the world and in the Torah is really deeply connected. And this inner structure really gives us a better understanding of things. It shows us the hidden architecture, the hidden uh, structure of things. So, So now these two elements of receptivity and correspondence, Kabbalah and Hakbalah, they form a pair, a very important pair. Receptivity is more male, correspondence is more female, for reasons we're not going to address now. But then they become like a father-mother or a man-woman. There's a bond between them. And the idea is that in order to correspond properly one structure to the other, we need to constantly bear in mind that there is an underlying unity to all of it, and this has to do with the receptivity for this divine inspiration in which, as I said before, everything is encapsulated in one moment or in one idea, one concept. And and it's it's undifferentiated. It's not yet differentiated. It's still it's all it's all one. Bina breaks it apart into its details and puts puts it together. But Bina needs Chokma to constantly remind it that it's really just one thing that's going on here. So Bina is corresponding and it needs Chokhmah, and of course Chokhmah needs Bina also, because if we're receptive to a very grandiose, very deep idea, but we don't understand it, then we're, then, what, how does it help us in any way? It doesn't help us in any way. And the idea is that the more we correspond one thing to the other, just like those loops that we put them in, we take a clasp and we put two of them together, and then another clasp, and two more are joined, and then with each and every clasp, they, they're connected more and more, the idea is that we're making really connections between the lower realms and the higher realms, between ourselves and Hashem. Where Hashem tells us there is a parallel, a correspondence, the loops correspond, everything, every detail down here corresponds to something up there. You need to find the right clasps and put them all together and connect them. And this is the act of correspondence of Hakbalah. And the more we do this, the more reality is really unified. The underlying unifying structure is more and more revealed. And we can see that although on the surface we see diff- different islands uh, disconnected, if we go deeper, we go diving, we see that all these islands are really part of the same the same landscape. It's all they're all one. So um, these are the first two meanings. So the f- the first one has to do with with receptivity, le kabel, to be open. And once the Kabbalah tells me some things, they said, "Well, thank you for a su- for." For uh, agreeing to adopt the um, underlying assumptions of Kabbalah, now that you're in the game, you're in the loop, you're, we're here together. We're opening the Kabbalah book. You need to find the hidden structures, the connections, and correspond different things to one another. And this creates this increasing sense of unity. This is really what Kabbalah learning is all about. So now we have two aspects for Kabbalah: a, a semi-prophetic 
aspect that has to do that you can't just judge it or or study it in a critical uh, way that you're not really into it. You have to be present and inside and, and open your mind and open your heart. And then the second aspect is that Kabbalah, is much of it is about really creating correspondences and therefore showing the different things that are connected to one another. In fact, this is what we're doing right now. We're taking three, the third will appear in a minute, three meanings uh, to the word Kabbalah, and we're corresponding them to a Kabbalistic model, which is the model of the Sefirot, or in this case, the first three Sefirot, the intellectual Sefirot. And just by, cre- just, just by putting these, these two systems together, the Sefirot on one hand, the different meanings of the root Kuf Bet Lamed on the other, and we're putting them together, something magical happens. We see that Kabbalah ha- has different aspects to it, and now we can even understand how they are. First we need to be receptive, then we need to put it all together, correspond it. Now we're arriving at the third meaning, uh, which is corresponds to the third intellectual sefirah, which is called Da'at, or knowledge. And it's very, very close to receptivity, Lekabel, it's acceptance. If I, this would be in Hebrew, I would say that receptivity is Kabbalah, correspondence is Hakbalah, and acceptance is Hitkablut. Hitkablut is a different iteration on the same root, Kuf Bet Lamed, but we want to uh, think about how Kabbalistic ideas that we're studying are truly accepted within our hearts. There's an expression in Hebrew, Mitkabel al Hadat. Mitkabel al Hadat means make sense, uh, but literally it means being accepted by knowledge, by Da'at. So this is why Da'at corresponds to this third meaning. And and what is Da'at all about? Da'at is all about, well, we should say this regarding all this field. So Chokhmah, we said, is, is being inspired by, by receiving inspiration from above, and then Bina is taking it apart and, and making it into a structure that makes sense, an intelligible structure. And then what that is all about, knowledge, is about now making, building a bridge between the, the mind and the heart. All this, both Chokhmah and Bina are very intellectual. But that is about union, connection, and it wants to reunify the intellect with the emotions and, and take all the insights that the, the head has, or has arrived at, down into our hearts. And this is what that is all about. And this is why it goes with the expression Mitkabel al dat, accepted by the dat, or another close term is mitiyashev al halev, is able to sit down, or rest on my heart. When something is mitiyashev al halev sheli al libi, it means my heart is now is quieted and sort of seated. And what you said now it sits on my, it sits on my heart. Mitiyashev al libi goes along with mitkabel al daati. This is the third aspect of what Kabbalah is. It's the most surprising one, but it's very important. Uh, it, it says the following. It says, Kabbalah is very, very weird in the beginning. It has a lot of esoteric terms. It doesn't seem to speak about normal reality. About It speaks about a strange, high, mystical reality. This is what receptivity was all about. We have to open up to this. And, but, but, but the, here comes the interesting thing. Despite the fact that Kabbalah is so, uh, what's the word, abstruse, or, uh, or I'm not sure of the word obtuse, uh, although it's, uh, it's not understood, and uh, it's very unintuitive the way the language it speaks with different terminology and mystical concepts. Despite all this, if we learn Kabbalah and we don't give up in the middle, if we take an issue, in, uh, a topic in Torah, and I want to go all the way deeply, deeper into it, and ultimately we have to get to Kabbalah. And the idea here is, and this is the third aspect of Kabbalah, it tells us that if we do this, and we make the effort, and we go the, via the long path of the learning, some, learning the esoteric Kabbalistic aspect of something, finally, in the long run, it quietens the heart, it sits well on the heart, it's mit yashev al alev, it's mit kabel al adat. It, it doesn't come first. We couldn't have put acceptance as the first element, and we put receptivity instead, because receptivity acknowledges the fact you don't understand it, and it doesn't sit on your heart, and it doesn't make sense. 
and then you will start going into where well, we can show that there are arrows here there are really stages here we start with this and then we move to uh, taking apart the ideas and putting together in structures like we're doing right now but and then so again there's a very long route right we can see it's a very roundabout route but then it, we get to a place that suddenly the two elements the two parents so to speak the receptivity chokhma the father and bina the mother are are unified and they give birth to a third faculty which is that and and when they're connected and when that is present it really means that now it sits on our heart it touches us more deeply than an explanation which didn't use the Kabbalistic terminology just trying to learn any topic in Torah or Judaism or to understand the world and using the regular rational tools then we would understand it but not necessarily emotionally or spiritually accept what we learned acceptance there's a there's a, a chasm to be crossed here this is the chasm between the the, the the head and the heart or the mind and the heart and this is what that is all about that is like this uh, like this bridge or channel that helps all the insights from Chokhmah and Bina, wisdom and understanding to go filter down into our hearts and and be accepted by our hearts and the reason Kabbalah is so strange at the beginning and, and, and I have to receive it without understanding. But finally, so uh, is, is such a wisdom that the heart recognizes that it makes sense to it. The reason is that it's really the deepest part of the Torah. In order to get to the deepest part of ourselves, we need the deepest part of the, of the Torah. And, and it, it, because it's so deep, then the first impression we would have is that we don't understand it, it's too weird, it's far away from who we are, everything we know and understand. But if we don't give up, when we stick through, through this to the end, and, we, and we, under, we, get, we get an understanding, a deeper understanding of the Kabbalistic concepts, we would, we would see, we would discover, we, would, we will be surprised to discover that it's this deep, spiritual concepts and ideas that sit well in our hearts more than the more rational or logical or uh, halachic nigle revealed aspect elements why because it's for the same reason because it's so deep and it echoes the deeper parts within us so the first um, the fact that it's so deep ex it explains both why it's so hard to learn at the beginning, but it also explains why, in the long run, it gives us the most emotionally or spiritually satisfying explanations or answers to any topic in Judaism. But we have to go through the long way. We have to start with receiving without understanding. Then we have to make the effort of learning very deeply the different structures and how they, how they all come together and how they help us see correspondence between different, ostensibly different phenomena. And finally, through this long, sort of indirect uh, route, we arrive at uh, a, an, an, an instinctive and an immediate dat. That means to be, to be union, uh, to be unified, and and really deeply connected to what we're learning. We need Kabbalah for this. So. Um, these are the the three meanings of of Kabbalah, but hold it right there there's actually a fourth meaning and i didn't say this in the beginning because it's a different level it's a different idea and now we move on to this a, ver a verse in zechariah prophet zechariah one of the 12 uh, small or shorter prophets in the in the bible uh has the, at its in its final chapter one of, one, of, one of its deepest prophecies and it says yom echad hu there shall be one day this is beautiful because the Torah starts with the first day of creation and then when it ends it says and there was evening and there was morning one day it doesn't say first day like it does on the following days the second day third day fourth day it says not first day but one day and one day is of course we can use this term as saying not just one day about the past, one day about the future. Well, one day, someday, one day, I hope to do this. And here, the the, the, pro, the Prophet Zechariah is playing off this. So he says, Yom Echad, which is, we all know, was used to sum up the, the, the first day of creation. 
But then he uses it regarding to regarding the future. The Hayya, one day in the future, there will be one day, a day of oneness. Only Hashem shall know it. And it'll be neither day or nor night. And even when it's when it's evening time, there will be light. That's what the verse says. Um, what we want to focus on is this this short part of this, lo yom velo lala, neither day nor night. And one of the best ways of understanding this, of, or any verse, is to open up the Aramaic translators. In this case, we're talking about Targum Yonatan, the translation of Yonatan, or that's ascribed uh, to Yonatan. And when he's explaining this part, lo yom velo lala, neither day nor night, uh, he adds he adds a very interesting word. He says, lo nehor yemam velo chikvel laila. It would this eternal day of Hashem uh, will not be will not have the light of day, right? It says in in the original verse says Lo Yom Velo Laila, neither day nor night. But Targum Yonatan, which adds uh, also Midrashim, he says not as neither light of day nor dark of night. But notice that the word he uses for dark or darkness is Kevel. The darkness of night. So now we have a fourth and final meaning for what Kabbalah is. Kabbalah has to do with receiving, with corresponding, with my heart accepting things. It also has to do with darkness. It's one of the Aramaic words for darkness. Generally, Aramaic has a sort of dark or nighttime language, we can say. It was Rabbi Nachman who pointed out the fact that the word Targum, which means translation, but specifically refers to the Aramaic translation of the Torah, that Targum in Gematria equals Tardema, going to sleep. When do we sleep? We sleep at night. And the idea is that reading the translation for something is a bit like sleeping, it's a bit like dreaming. Uh, when things are lost in translation, it's because things are, when we're going to sleep and when we're dreaming, many of the details, the rational details, they're lost, they don't make sense, but then other details surface. So it's very appropriate that it is in the Aramaic translation that we have a sort of night version, a nighttime, sleepy, dreamy version of the verses. And it is in this translation that something new happens. We're not said, it's not said neither day nor night. It says neither as the light of day nor as the dark of night. And the dark, the word for dark, for darkness here is the strange new word kvel, kvel, which is really a fourth usage, a fourth meaning for what Kabbalah is, or what the word Kuv Betlamid is. So, what does it mean? It means darkness, it means night. And, and where should we put this, right? We have, let's, let's go back to our, um, uh, the structure of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Kabbalah, Hakbalah, Hitkablut, receiving knowledge from above, understanding, making all the correspondences and parallel structures, and then finally allowing it to settle and sink into our hearts, uh, we should really now have a fourth Sefirah. And we're going to use now the Sefirah, really the first Sefirah that comes before Chokhmah, Bina, and Dat, which together creates the acronym Chabad. Before that, we have a Sefirah called Ketel. Ketel means crown. It, it's called crown because it's above the head, so to speak, above the rational faculties. It's the source of everything that we are receiving in Chochmah, when we're receiving a knowledge or inspiration from above. Where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? It's coming from the Ketel, or the superconscious that's above our consciousness, above the rationality. And here we should put the fourth meaning of the words uh, of the word Kuf Bet which is darkness. And we can say that Kabbalah is ultimately very, very mysterious. It's, it, you know, this, the superconscious is the source of the, the highest lights. But since those lights are not incorporated into our consciousness, they're not, it's not, they're not all pnimi or inner light. They're surrounding lights. They're, they're somewhere above. It means that for us, their experience is darkness. And just like this beautiful verse uh, before that we saw that talks about this one day in the future, not a day in the past. One day is the first day of creation, but one day is also 
as we say, one day in the future. So this one future day is a day in which neither day, it's neither day nor night, it's both day and night, uh, because there shall be light in the evening, during the night time there shall be light. All this is referring to the deepest of all mysteries, which is the the all the different um, um, contradictions and paradoxes that have to do with with learning Kabbalah, learning divine knowledge. So we're going to put darkness at the keter, the crown. And now we can understand what's going on when we're going through the three stages of first receiving and then turning it into a structure. And then when our heart accepts it, really what our heart accepts is how this darkness that was uh, first something very mis- like a foggy mystery above our intellect, above our head, is now it's lighting up our own hearts. It's within our own hearts. And now we can add this sort of two-way arrow that that really points at this deep connection between the crown and knowledge, between Keter and Dat, that whenever we something is accepted into our hearts, it's really a revelation of something that used to be dark before. It connects us to this deep mystery of things. Uh, that, that's above our, our, our consciousness. That has, means consciousness. But Keter is above our consciousness. And there's the, a channel is really created between the, the mysteries of the Torah and the mysteries of God and between things that, are, that make sense to us, that touch our hearts and we can understand them. And now really what we have is like a map of three that are really four stages or aspects of what Kabbalah is uh, just by from looking at the word Kabbalah, so just to sum it all up, we took the 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 root kuf bet lamid KBL that appears in our parasha when referring to the connecting of the sets of cloth that cover the tabernacle, which make the tabernacle one, as the verse says. And we said, let's let's look into this this root because it's the root of the word Kabbalah. We opened up three Hebrew meanings of the word, and then a final. Aramaic meaning of the word. The three Hebrew meanings have to do with the three intellectual cognitive sefirot, three stages. And then the final Aramaic meaning, which is uh, the the nighttime uh, as nocturnal aspect of Hebrew, that's Aramaic, that gives us the more mysterious that is always as if it's through the lens of translation, do we really grasp it? Because it's above our intellect. That's like translation. Translation, when you study something in translation, you know you don't really know what's going on there. You know you're only seeing like a shadow or a reflection of the original. So it's very appropriate that the fourth and final and deepest really meaning of Kabbalah is we 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 understand this through a translated word because it hints at the fact that we never really understand what's going on there. It's dark, it's unknown, it's above our consciousness, so it's an Aramaic word. Putting all these four together, they combine into this map of of understanding just what Kabbalah is. This is our show for this week, and may you have a Shabbat Shalom, and I'll see you next week. Hi, if you've gotten this far, you've probably enjoyed the class. If so, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Patreon is a platform designed to help independent creators receive financial support from their followers. These classes take time and effort to make, and any amount really helps. You can check out the link to my Patreon account in the description below. Thank you.